pour la traduction, le English is on one, Francais is sur deux, et espagnol is sur trois. Uh, for English, you won't need the headsets because most of the conference is in English anyway. Cinq minutes. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire Bonsoir tout le monde. Good evening everybody. Welcome. Salam alaikum. Before I introduce the conference, I would like to acknowledge our gratitude to the native people of this land who we are using their unceded territory for this conference and express our support to them in their fight for their rights. My name is Ihab Lutayev. I am the chairperson of the Egyptian Canadian Coalition for Democracy. I will be emceeing this event tonight and I will introduce our other guests in a minute. But first let me tell you that this event and many other events in the forum about the situation in Egypt in particular, were organized by a block of Egyptian organizations comprised of three main organizations and other supporters. The Egyptian Canadian Home Organization is a grassroots organization from Montreal. The Egyptian Canadian Coalition for Democracy is a Canada-wide group that supports a democratic, a true democratic reform in Egypt. And the Egyptian Revolutionary Council is an international body that is fighting for the return of true democracy in Egypt. In the name of the three organizations, I welcome you here tonight. And let me share with you the program of the evening so that you would know how we will go tonight. Um, Dr. Maha from the Egyptian uh, Revolutionary Council will speak first, followed by Mr. Harun Siddiqui. That should take us around 45 minutes to an hour into the event. And then the remaining time will be used for questions and answers, leaving five minutes to each of the three of us for closing remarks. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Maha Azam. Dr. Maha is the head of the Egyptian Revolutionary Council. A, board, a broad platform that promotes civil and democratic, a civil and democratic state in Egypt. Dr. Maha is also a former fellow at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House, from 2002 till 2015. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Maha Azam. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'd like to start by thanking the Social Forum for giving us the opportunity to exchange ideas, to meet, and to learn about each other's causes. We have a great gathering this evening, and I'm very privileged to be here among you. I head the Egyptian Revolutionary Council, an organization that was set up 
in 2014 as a response to the military coup in my country that stole our nascent democracy and returned us to military dictatorship. It is a broad platform that seeks, as Ehab has pointed to, the creation of a civil state that respects the rule of law and builds democracy in Egypt. A leading country in the region, a country of 90 million people, it should have been given the chance to proceed along the path to democracy. In 2012, Egypt had the first free and fair elections. Those elections brought about a new hope in Egypt. It followed the Arab Spring of 2011. In 2011, Egyptians from all walks of life went out to call for freedom, for bread, freedom, and social justice. Those aspirations are very real, not only to Egypt, but to the whole region. And what we have seen in terms of what people term as the reversal of the Arab Spring is essentially a lull in what I believe will be still a process, an ongoing process that will try to reaffirm the rights of peoples throughout the region. Revolutions happen in waves. They do not happen all at once. We have seen the first wave in 2011. And even in 2011, we must remember that the peoples of the region and the people in Egypt had struggled previously in order to combat and stand up against dictatorship in their country, which existed for 60 years. Egypt has suffered from military dictatorship for 60 years. But today, it suffers the worst kind of abuse of human rights and the worst face of military dictatorship. We heard over the last two days some speakers tell us about the abuse that is happening in Egypt, from Amnesty International to academics, telling us about the trials and the difficulties of journalists, of women and children. I can tell you that Egypt today, according to Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, is a country that faces the worst human rights record in the, one, of, one of the worst human record, rights records in the world. Egypt under General Sisi since the coup of 2013 has witnessed one of the worst massacres in the modern history of Europe or the world. It certainly is one of the worst massacres in the modern history of Egypt and constitutes a crime against humanity. In one day, which we will commemorate in two days, on August the 14th, the regime of General Sisi was responsible for the massacre of almost 1,000 people in a number of hours. People who sat in a peaceful protest, demanding the return of their elected president and saying that they didn't want their democracy stolen from them. The litany of abuse by the security services in Egypt is ongoing today. Only a few days ago, in a prison, in the prison of Menya, people, inmates, were denied water in uh, temperatures that reached over 40 degrees. People die in Egyptian prisons. Women and men are raped in Egyptian prisons. Egyptian prisons hold young children, not adolescents, but children. The Egyptian judiciary is one of the most corrupt in the world. It is a judiciary that passes execution verdicts in the hundreds and in one occasion over a thousand. The Egyptian judiciary is an arm of the military dictatorship, as is the media in Egypt. After the coup of 2013, the media in Egypt played one of the worst roles seen by any country in the modern era. 
It played a role similar to fascist regimes in Italy and Germany in the 20th century. It started a narrative of hate and created division in society. Egypt today is not just a republic of fear. Egypt today, through its military, espouses fascism, the worst kind of fascism. It creates division between its people, it focuses on one group and it claims that that group is a terrorist organization or espouses terrorist ideas and therefore it is justified to imprison and torture that group and kill it and kill them. But it doesn't stop at one group. As we know with fascism from our history and from our knowledge of what happened in Europe, it never stops at one group. It ends up including all those who oppose the regime. And that is what is happening in Egypt today. The Egyptian regime not only fights the Muslim Brotherhood, it fights all those who oppose it. The Egyptian regime does not tolerate opposition and it does not respect freedoms or the rule of law. We've heard a great deal about human rights violations in Egypt. We know that Egypt's prisons now hold over 50,000 political dissidents. But one thing that we should also be aware of is that as we speak out about human rights and as we expose what is happening in a country like Egypt, we must also realize that it is the nature of the political system that we here today must also be opposed to and raise our voices against. It is time that the, the, the peoples of the region of the Middle East and of Egypt, which is the case we're looking at today, are allowed to return to their democracy. The West and the democratic West in particular should not be supporting regimes that engender fear in their people and create a sense of insecurity for their citizens and breed extremism and radicalization by the very policies they pursue and therefore threaten not only the lives of Egyptian citizens but the lives of citizens throughout the world. I'll put it to you that supporting a regime like that of General Sisi is a national security threat to all of us, whether someone like me who lives in the United Kingdom or those who live here in Canada. Dictatorship is not the way to peace and security and stability. It ultimately breeds radicalization and extremism. I studied radicalization for many years in the policy institutes to which I was associated. And I remember looking closely at the extremism and the violence of Al-Qaeda. And at the time we thought that we had reached, in a sense, the most extreme version of radicalization. But look where we are now. We have ISIL. We have seen what has happened in Syria and in the region, and we see the bloody mindedness of the terrorists whenever they strike against the innocents. That is not the world we want to live in. That is the world we reject and which we believe dictators like Sisi and others in the region help engender. That is why we have to fight with all our might and with our voices raised high, especially in democracies where we can do so, those that breed insecurity. Our understanding of, of security also needs to change. Security is not just about the security of nations that have interests in the region of the Middle East. It is about the security of citizens. It is about the right to economic development the right to see their economies grow and flourish in a way that benefits the majority of their people. What we see in Egypt today and elsewhere in the Arab world is a small elite squandering the wealth of a nation. This has been the case for many decades. Corruption is endemic in the system in Egypt. 
it is endemic and it has bred a society in which there is a huge gap between the haves and have-nots. You have an elite that lives in luxury, that doesn't pay its taxes, that exploits the wealth of the poor, and you have a population in which over 40% of the population live on under $2 a day. Now that is not a fair system. That is not a system that I believe those that believe in freedom and rights of peoples across the world should be supporting. The message I think to all of us here is that abuse of human rights and violations, as much as they are exposed and as much as that there is a call to the, for the freeing of political prisoners, must go hand in hand with a call for basic freedoms to be respected. The freedom of uh, assembly, the freedom of free speech, the freedom of the protesters to protest knowing that they will not be arrested and tortured. Those are some of the asks that we constantly make as the Egyptian Revolutionary Council to officials that we meet. But it is also some of the asks we make to civil society and NGOs, so that they are aware that the quest of our people in Egypt is one for freedom and rights. That struggle for freedom and rights is not a new one. It is an ongoing struggle that followed the end of colonialism in much of the Muslim majority countries. But shamefully, that struggle is still ongoing today. And it is ongoing because there are regimes in the region that have been supported by outside powers, regional and international. That struggle is ultimately one that the peoples of the region are not going to stop struggling for. And since 2011, there has been a very important shift that has happened in Egypt. And that is that the barrier of fear broke in 2011. And more people than ever started to realize that the narrative that the regime through the state-sponsored media had been selling them was a lie. That barrier of fear brought out the youth of Egypt. It brought out people of very different backgrounds and ideologies to stand up against the regime. The problem is that two years later, the old regime and the deep state made a comeback, a counter-revolution. And we know about counter-revolutions from our European history and other histories. That counter-revolution came back with a vengeance, and it wanted to instill fear again, to tell the Egyptian people, don't you ever dare come out into the squares again. Don't you ever dare come out into Tahrir Square again. And if you sit peacefully in a sit-in in Rabah Square, we will come in and kill you and burn you. And that is exactly what they did three years ago, which we will commemorate in two days' time. The lesson that the Egyptian security forces and the military regime and General Sisi are sending the people of Egypt is that we will instill fear in order to remain in power and that we will continue our corrupt practices so that we have a coterie of support from an elite and, uh, and in gender, continue to engender crony capitalism in order for us to have the coterie of support that helps us survive. But what has happened today is that yes, many Egyptians are fearful of coming out, but there are also many Egyptians that know it is a matter of time before they come out and that they will face the tanks and they will face the security forces because there is no other alternative. The other alternative is to live in this desperate situation which will only get worse. The economy of Egypt now is floundering. There are budget deficits, there, the currency uh, is worthless. Egyptians today, um, uh, those who live on subsidies, know that the IMF loan that is going to come through will also not make anything, anything better. 
ultimately to ask a population to tighten its belt when an elite is living uh, the, uh, the, the life of kings is not going to be acceptable. You want a government that actually has the trust of its people, that has not stolen from its people, and that then, if it needs to do, do reforms, carry out reforms, and ask its people to tighten its belt and to accept austerity, then it means that the whole nation is doing so at the same time. Egypt today is a country that is on the brink of change. That change may come in months, it may come in a couple of years, but ultimately that is a very short span of time in terms of history. And what is important is to remember that the Egyptian people will remember who stood by them and who stood against them. Shamefully, the democracies of the West seem to think that the issue of interests and trade supersede morality and ethics. I think that the democratic West and civil society in the West needs to review its policy towards Egypt, its foreign policy um, attitude towards Egypt and to countries of the region. The two come together, both morality and ethical foreign policy and interests, because ultimately democracies can be the best partners in fighting what threatens all of us, they can be partners that allow for trade and for stability and for security, but in terms of mutual respect and benefit. And that is all we ask for. We know that our people will continue to struggle, but our struggle will become much easier if in that process, people throughout the world, people of conscience, and there are many, and I work with many in the United Kingdom and throughout Europe and the United States, and I have seen this here in Canada as well, that people of conscience together raise their voices and turn to their governments and put pressure on them and say to them, perhaps it's time that we shape a different foreign policy in regards to our support to murderers and dictators that do not allow the freedom and rights of their people to be respected. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Meher. Uh, I forgot to ask you to please turn off your cell phones and I'm hearing something beeping. I don't know where it's coming from, but please try to uh, Keep electronic devices at bay. Uh, our next speaker is Harun Sudiqui. Harun Sudiqui is uh, the editorial page editor emeritus of the Toronto Star. He has reported or supervised coverage of Canada for 48 years. He has ultimate knowledge of the evolution of its public policy. He has written extensively on the Canadian model of pluralism and spoken about Canada in Canada and around the world. He's also reported from nearly 50 countries. A winner of many journalistic awards, he was also awarded the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario. He is the author of the bestseller, Being Muslim, among others. He describes himself as an incurably optimistic Canadian, and this is the bio that I got. How is it Thank you, Rahab. Thank you, Maha. Thank you all for coming. Um, generally, when we hold conferences or I speak to country-specific topics, uh, what really happens in Canada, Canada is blessed with the diaspora from almost all the world. And when you have a conference in Egypt or Qatar or whatever, generally the diaspora turns up and all their divisions and so on, especially to all the Iranians and Egyptians and so on. Rare is the occasion when you get the diaspora as well as uh, ordinary Canadians and international observers and so on. And this is really one of those rare occasions. So thank you all for coming. And those of you who have come from abroad, welcome again to Canada, the most pluralistic and tolerant and celebratory nation in the world. Uh, like Ihab, I want to acknowledge that we all stand 
on the territory of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, uh, with whom we have a very shameful record. But of late, there's a consciousness in this country to acknowledge it and try and resolve the issue. And the highest body in this country, the Supreme Court of Canada, has upheld that the way to proceed is through land claims settlements, and which is what we are in the process of doing. So as we fight injustice around the world, we ought not to forget the plight of the Aboriginal people of this country. Um, Maha has spoken um, very well about what is happening in Egypt. Um, I will speak about how the rest of the world, including Canada, has reacted to the events uh, of Arab Spring, uh, which, which we were all elated and so on, and how our hopes and the hopes of Egyptians and the other Arabs have been dashed since, in particular in Egypt. Uh, Maha referred to the support of foreign governments, or at least the lack of support for human rights in Egypt and so on. One ought not to be really surprised by what is happening because the Western record of intervention in the Middle East has a long and dishonorable history. Um, let's remind ourselves that it was way back, what, 1798, that the French invaded and occupied uh, Mr. Napoleon uh, Quebec at that time. Through the 19th century, um, the British intervention uh, and the British uh, constant um, uh, handling of Egypt we are all familiar with. First, through holding controlling shares in the Suez Canal, for example, and that was to ensure the shortest possible route to India, my whole country, uh, which was then ruled by the British as well. Uh, then, of course, through the 1882 uh, shelling, bombing, and occupation of Egypt by the British, which was then uh, part of the uh, Ottoman Empire. And then, of course, through the early 20th century machinations of Gertrude uh, Bell, and the famous Lawrence of Arabia, those of you who have seen the movie would know that much of that plotting was done uh, in no other place except Cairo. Uh, then you get through the Pico-Sykes Agreement under which France and Great Britain divvied up the Middle East and artificially drew borders in the sand, literally, uh, which in fact uh, is the genesis of many of the problems that we see in the Middle East up to this day. Then through the creation of Israel in 1948, the attack on the Suez Canal, uh, and then the other machinations that have continued since, through mostly client regimes, uh, which are either monarchical or dictatorial, military or otherwise. That is not the only sin that the West has done, we need to acknowledge honestly that uh, the United States in particular has systematically undermined democracy throughout the Middle East uh, in the last century. It was of course the CIA organized coup uh, in 1953 in Iran that toppled the elected government of Mohammad Mossadegh, uh, an event that Iranians remind you up to this day, and in discussions uh, that take place in geopolitics, in this event is never too far from the minds and collective consciousness of the Iranians. Or the long support that the Americans provided the wretched Shah of Iran, one of the most oppressive rulers ever, uh, to rule the broader Middle East. There, of course, there was the uh, French, uh, American, and by extension, the Western support for the military uh, in Algeria, which toppled uh, the duly elected Islamists from power, and uh, in fact, then presided over one of the worst uh, civil warfare and massacres that we have seen in modern times. Uh, then, of course, there was the 2006 election in Gaza, where Hamas was duly elected in what was deemed to be a fair election, and of course it was 
considered a name a terrorist organization, so we don't have to deal with it. And much to Canada's shame, it was Mr. Harper who made Canada the first country in the world uh, to boycott Hamas and declare it a terrorist organization. So our hands as Canadians are not all that clean. So given all this background, um, it was quite a surprise um, that in 2006, uh, Condoleezza Rice speaking, I think in Cairo, uh, Maha, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, said this, quote, for 60 years my country pursued stability at the expense of democracy in this region, and we achieved neither. Now we are taking a different course. We are supporting the democratic aspirations of all people, unquote. Kandali Sarais, all this record and this Kandali Sarais says this, it surprised the world. A greater surprise was that her boss, the infamous George W. Bush, said this, quote, America could not be in the position of endorsing elections only when we like the outcome, unquote. <laughs> but the record of the United States hasn't changed. It changed briefly when Obama became president and of course gave this soaring address that we are all familiar with in 2009 in Cairo again, addressing the Islamic world and promised a new era. He even telephoned Mr. Mubarak, uh, trying to ease him out of power. He dilly in 2011 when the Harim Square was going on but eventually came around to the side of supporting democracy. But none of this lasted too long, because we saw not too many months after that, that Mr. Obama was silent when the Saudis marched tanks into Bahrain to crush a simple revolt uh, by the majority people wanting nothing but human rights and democracy that Maha spoke about. And of course, when the coup took place in Egypt, Mr. Obama, Mr. Kerry, Mr. Harper could not utter the C word. They could not call it a coup, or they would not call it a coup. Because if you call it a coup under American law, under American law, if there's a military coup, American aid must cease. But of course, American aid continues, $1.6 billion a year. Uh, at last count, something like 73 billion so far, which goes to strengthen the military, supplies F-16s and tanks and night vision glasses and equipment that the Egyptian government still does not account for whether or not it has used in oppressing people and killing people. In fact, there is a US government report, uh, which came out earlier this year, 77 pages, uh, which says that the State Department has failed to find out from the Egyptian government where the American armaments are going. Are they going in the suppression of civil rights and civil, uh, civil pro protests and so on? This debate is familiar to us because this debate has been taking place in Canada vis-a-vis -vis the uh, armored tanks that we have supplied to Saudi Arabia, for example. And the question always has been, and the global mail has been in the forefront of this, is whether or not any of that equipment was used in Bahrain, for example, or is it being used in Saudi Arabia? We could not get a straight answer from Mr. Harper, nor have we got a straight answer from, Mr. from the Trudeau government so far. So in all in all, uh, the West speaks with a forked tongue when it deals with the Arabs, and especially the Muslim world. Um, we ought not to be surprised by what has happened because that is the geopolitical interest and so on. Where do, <clears throat> beyond the West, you know, if you go beyond the West, who else forms this unholy alliance uh, with General Sisi? Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait. They've given them $25 billion so far to prop up this military junta. 
why is Saudi Arabia, why is the United Arab Emirates and other monarchies and so on so scared of the Muslim Brotherhood? It is not because the Muslim Brotherhood poses a military threat to them. It's not because the Muslim Brotherhood is an armed or a good ill outfit. It is simply because it is the largest grassroots organization that can mobilize people and be the chief instrument of bringing democracy to Egypt. It is the Muslim Brotherhood's affiliates in the Muslim world uh, that are also similarly capable of uh, organizing people, mobilizing people towards this common goal that we all cherish, democracy. This upsets the status quo. It does not suit the monarchies, nor does it suit General Sisi, nor does it suit the United States or anybody else. Thus, the unholy alliance. There is another unholy alliance, and that is inside Egypt, that works against the Muslim Brotherhood. Even though millions of people voted for the Muslim Brotherhood, not in one fluke election, not in two, but in eight elections, two referendums, two rounds each of the two houses of parliament, two rounds of presidential elections. Despite all those elections and the massive majorities that the Muslim Brotherhood won, it was eventually elbowed out of power. Who uh, was the alliance, who formed the alliance uh, to bring this wretched result about? One, of course, the army that we are familiar with. Two are the members of the deep state that Maha tangentially referred to. Deep state refers to the tentacles of a state, which is army, judiciary, um, academic circles, part of the media, businesses, and so on, crony capitalists, that are interested in keeping the status quo because they benefit from it. This is the same deep state that brought about four coups in Turkey, for example. So this entire deep state had no interest in the people, whether led by the Brotherhood or by anybody else, forming a government or displacing these people or taking away some of their uh, great uh, benefits. The second leg of this unholy trinity is the Egyptian elite. And that elite is of two kinds. Those who are in effect waging class warfare on the unwashed. They have their privileges, they have lived a certain life, and they feel threatened by the people. And the same thing, in fact, was seen in Turkey until the election of Mr. Erdogan, whose dictatorial tendencies we can park aside for the time being, but who brought about the first democratic emergence of the people from the inner Anatolia into the commercial enterprise of Egypt and into the democracy and went on to win unprecedented three majority governments, one government uh, uh, getting more popular vote than the last one. So he has his faults and we can discuss it in the question and answer period. But the deep state reference that I'm giving is exactly the same. The people, the old elite of Turkey just could not stand all these hijabis and the unwashed from the rural areas coming and doing business and holding positions. A similar dynamic has been at work in Egypt. The other kind of elite, the third leg of this unholy, unholy trinity, are these deeply secular people, and there are secularists and secularists, there are secularists from Laïcité in France and secularists uh, in India and secularists of different kinds. These are the secularists I'm speaking about who are deeply estranged from other Muslims. This is also a phenomenon that we see uh, in Turkey. It's, art, it's partly a function of the colonial legacy because the way the Brits ruled and the way the French ruled in Nigeria, for example, is to put up an elite uh, westernize them, put them in suits and so on, 
And one of the first things they learned to do was to look down on their own people. And, this, and the second reason for this great estrangement between secularist Muslim, and I use it in quotations, and a lot of majority and pious people is also a reaction to some of the excesses of some of the religious Muslims who have been intolerant not only of Christians and uh, Baha'is and other people, but of those Muslims who are not pious to the extent that some of these religious Muslims want them to be. So this divide, this polarization is deep and it's real. What these secularists and these opponents of Muslim Brotherhood say about the Muslim Brotherhood and the Muslims is so vicious that commentators have said, I've got my time. Uh, commentators have said that it reminds them of the kind of uh, language that was used against the Jews in Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Um, or it reminds me, the way these people talk about the Muslim Brotherhood and so on, they're fascists, they're terrorists, they're dogs, they're pigs. The language that is used, ironically, is about the same as Islamophobes use about all Muslims these days. The extreme irony that we have this parallel. There are several other parallels that are worth mentioning. One I mentioned, uh, the deep state. The second one is that this coup that has taken place uh, has been one of the most vicious coups that we have seen anywhere in the world. The massacre that uh, uh, Maha spoke about, for example, was worse than the Tiananmen Square murders in Beijing, which killed maybe 300 people or up to 900 people or 1,000 people. It's in the same league, it's worse than, for example, what we remember, all of us, 1975 Soweto in South Africa. How many killed? 169. Or the famous 1960 Sharpeville massacre in which 69 people were killed. So here we're talking 900,000 people killed in cold blood in one day. In fact, it's in the same league as the infamous massacre that took place in 1919 in India by the British, when General Dyer opened fire on 15,000 unarmed civilians who were protesting against British colonial rule. Those of you who have seen the movie Gandhi would know that scene. Gruesome. Whereas General Dyer was prosecuted for that crime, General Sisi has not been. That was 1919 and this is 2016 and the parallels are so strong but that General Dyer was prosecuted and David Cameron traveled to India three years ago to apologize to the Indians for that massacre. We await the day when Mr. Sisi would be prosecuted or the military regime apologizes for it. This coup has been one of the worst also in the extent uh, of the damage that has been done. 2,500 people have been killed so far. Officially, 32,500 are in jail. Maha speaks of 50,000, nobody knows for sure. And there are repeated reports uh, by international organizations of torture and other forms of abuse and wholesale disappearances of people. This police state is akin to or worse than the communist states during the Cold War in Eastern Europe. Same iron grip on the people, same kind of intelligence agencies, uh, Stasi and others and so on, are working away and nobody trusts anybody else. Mr. C.C. won 98% of the vote in the presidential election, just like other tin pot dictators in Africa and the dictators in uh, Eastern Europe. The coup is worse than 1973 in Chile. The Salvador Allende was the elected president was toppled by the military regime. It's in the same league or worse, depending on one's point of view, the 1976 military coup in Argentina, 
where the military overthrew Isabel Peron and people disappeared. And of course, those of you who are from India and Pakistan would know the coups in Pakistan. General Ayub Khan first, uh, General Yahya Khan, General Zia al Haq, and General Musharraf. There's one more thing. The most common thing about some of these coups is that sometimes it is welcomed by the people because they're so fed up of the chaos, they're so fed up of corrupt regimes and so on, that in Pakistan, when, when Musharraf took over, sweets were distributed in the streets. People were so happy. But it, and the, and the, some of the dictators and so on actually bring some efficiencies, turn the economy around and so on, and do make the trains run on time for a short time. Mr. CC has not even done that. The economy is going down the tubes, uh, and we can discuss about the economy. And unlike the other coups, where the army is satisfied by holding on to power, and does allow a certain degree of freedom, even Nasser allowed it at some time, and Mubarak allowed it sometime, some time, Musharraf certainly allowed it in Pakistan. This regime does not allow, does not do much any kind of dissent whatsoever. Which all of which really leads to this following conclusion. I think we cannot view Egypt, what all I have said, is jarring to some years because we don't read about it like this in our media. We don't hear about it, these facts, and these are not opinions that I've expressed, and maybe there are one or two opinions, mostly facts. We don't hear it from our politicians. The established narrative in the West bears no resemblance to the reality of Egypt as has been painted, and you can check it out yourself. So to view Egypt objectively, we need to remember and realize two things. That the language and terminology that's being used to dismiss and demonize Muslims, especially the Muslim Brotherhood, is about the same terminology that was used to dismiss and demonize communists in a previous generation. That was what was done in Chile, that was what was done in Argentina, that's what was done throughout uh, other places. Second, Islamophobia is a far more widespread disease than is generally acknowledged today, especially in the West. That it is a sinister form of racism and unmitigated bigotry that lets people, even decent people, cloud their judgment and think of Muslims in a different way than they think of other people. Democracy for everyone? Democracy, no, for not for Muslims. They can't be trusted with democracy. Human rights for everyone? Not for Muslims. Preciousness of life for everyone? Not Muslims. You, we can kill and as many Muslims as you want, and the headline would be on page 37 if, in fact, such a headline exists. So the most intellectually honest way to understand Egypt and stand in solidarity with ordinary Egyptians really <coughs> is to view them through universal principles that we espouse. That we oppose oppression, that we oppose oppression of all kinds, that we oppose military rule, that we stand for civil rule in all nations, that we agitate against the violations of the most fundamental basic human rights of citizens, and that, as Maha said, we stand up for the equal rights and dignity of Egyptians like any other people on earth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harun. Uh, we are going to uh, use the rest of the time. We have, for a question and answer period, we value the exchange that we're going to have. There are two microphones in the room, one here and one there. Please uh, line up behind the, the microphones for questions. I will try to balance the number of people we take from both mics. So if there's a long queue on one, I will take more from, from that side. So please. Uh, let's start with the gentleman that's already uh, the, One of the problems what you have in Egypt is very sinister and very cynical. 
is that what you have is a civilian fascist as well as a, a, a military fascist uh, oligarchy that's uh, seeking for the money. Well, the military in, in Egypt has tremendous industries, tremendous money. And Morsi himself was trying to pull for that and was trying to pillage that. And many, many of these civilian oligarchs are basically hungry for that type of money from the military industries that Egypt has. And you, Morsi, if you consider him a Democrat, he actually was telling the Egyptian mother, uh, Brotherhood to go and join ISIS and fight in Syria. So by very nature, he's a, he's a terrorist. He actually was encouraging and sending uh, the Muslim Brotherhood to Syria. And we know what the consequences are there. And this what happened with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was afraid that this demagogue was going to be out of control and going to topple and have tremendous problems for for in, the, in in Saudi Arabia. But what, what, what you do have is two two fascist groups. One is a civilian fascist democracy, and one and the other one is a military government fascist government. There is really no democracy in Egypt. Thank you. Um, I think there is a grave danger of equating uh, the democratic process that brought about uh, an elected civilian president with the current I think there's a grave uh, danger in equating uh, a democratic process that brought about a civilian government with the current fascist military regime. Uh, what you've just suggested, uh, if you allow me, is factually incorrect. Uh, uh, the support of Morsi's government for those fighting the dictatorship in Syria did not involve support for ISIS. On the contrary, what was happening in Syria right at the beginning in Dara was civilian peaceful opposition to a dictatorship that has been responsible for a genocide against its own people and one where the West, again, should have intervened far more uh, earlier, uh, far earlier in standing up against the Assad regime in a way that would have really uh, made a difference. So I think the equ uh, equating uh, a democratically elected leader and saying that he wanted to take control of uh, the, 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 the financial um, empire that the military controls today for his own interest and that of an oligarch is completely incorrect. On the contrary, one of the main things that made uh, Morsi very unpopular was that he wanted to instigate taxes on those that were wealthy that there was going to be far more accountability, that he was going to start weeding out corruption. What we were going to start seeing in Egypt is accountability. And we wanted to, to see that process continue. The democratic process in Egypt is not connected to one man. President Morsi was the choice of the people in 2012. If we had respected the democratic process, we may have seen the Egyptian people choose another president four years later, or they may have chosen the same president, but that choice was taken away from the Egyptian people, and that is precisely where we want to go back to, so that, that the people choose, and that uh, a, a system is not imposed on them, and certainly not a military system. Thank you. I think that's it. I would like to add a question here, just a second, a, a related question really, which is this ownership of the vast uh, empire by the military, um, how does this play into the complication of the situation in Egypt? And there, are there any parallels to that situation in other places around the world? Of 
course, there are parallels in Turkey, for example, that I spoke of deep state. That's, there's a parallel in Pakistan, similarly. Uh, what really happens is that a uh, lot of public enterprises are controlled by the army, uh, and they become public corporations and so on. And uh, most of the retired generals end up as CEOs of these corporations and, and uh, cross-subsidize each other. If you go to Karachi, for example, there is no defense colony, and you go to Islamabad, there's a defense colony. What is a defense colony? Defense colony is uh, taking vast tracts of choice land and leaving it among, among each other at subsidized rates. Uh, the Pakistani military and deep state, uh, by one estimate, uh, controls between 20 and 25 percent of the GDP of Pakistan. In a poor country, uh, if, in, if in Egypt, uh, uh, millions of people live on two dollars a day, the situation is no different in Pakistan. But in terms of uh, absconding with a quarter of the GDP of the country, Pakistani army has uh, no uh, trouble doing so. So there are examples like that in, 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 in Turkey, in Pakistan, and of course there is example like that in Myanmar uh, uh, until this recent democratic election and the military junta continues to enjoy uh, great benefits. So there are... Uh, yes, please. Describe the role of the U.S. Uh, government and Obama up to the stage of where he supported the uh, People's uh, Revolution. I wonder if you could carry on from that point and describe where the U.S. government's position has been through the various stages of the recent developments with Morsi and then with now with DC. No, I think what has happened is that. Uh, Obama briefly toyed with the idea of democracy, did support the Muslim Brotherhood, did support the government. Uh, but at the same time, uh, America uh, is, is grateful to Egypt for the peace treaty that it has signed uh, with Israel. Uh, it's in the interest of all people that, that such a peace treaty be maintained and so on. But should that be maintained at the price of $1.3 billion and denying democracy to Egyptians and so on? Because in the long run, the best peace comes uh, among democracies and democratic peoples and so on. So this is a misguided notion, that's one. Uh, Mr. Obama does not control Congress. Uh, and in Congress, uh, in fact, one Judiciary Committee of Congress, by a vote of 10 to or 12 to 8, just the other day said Muslim Brotherhood should be declared a terrorist organization, echoing Mr. C.C. and so on. So in the United States, some attempts have been made, but overall the policy remains as wretched as ever. Can I just add something to that? Um, under President Morsi, there was uh, no threat uh, to the to the Camp David Accords. Actually, the position of the Egyptian government, and some may have disagreed with it, even Egyptians, is that all treaties would be respected. Uh, there was certainly a, a cold peace, but that cold peace had been engendered even previously because the Egyptian people, in a sense, by the very position we're engendering that cold peace. But the treaties were being respected. Uh, so I think that, again, just on a point of fact. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes, go ahead. I'm Giovanni Pantanini from Italy. Uh, I. Uh, Personally, I don't like uh, uh, any of the leaders who appeared in, in the scene in both Egypt and, uh, uh, and other countries, uh, Arabic countries. But I would like to ask you, uh, 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 what's your opinion, if we can establish a parallelism between the case of Egypt with Morsi and uh, Al-Sisi? today, and 25 years ago in Algeria, the case of the Front Islamic, the Salud, the, the, the peace, and uh, the regime that happened uh, to, uh, to go in power immediately after those days. So is it possible for you to have uh, uh, some learning from comparing these two cases, Algeria in 1919 and Egypt today, with this gap, with this uh, 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 paradox that is inside a democracy, a party, you have a party like this, 
who promise that if we gain the election, he will abolish democracy. There is some parallel that, in, in your opinion, is possible to establish to be established in, in those two cases. Please. Thank you. Yes. You know, this is one of those great lies that are told about Muslims. And some idiot may have said, once we form the government, we are going to abolish democracy. It doesn't happen like that. No <coughs> party was saying that in Algeria. No, no party in Egypt was saying that either. No party in Pakistan says that either. Some idiots on the fringes always say that. And it becomes a cause celebre. Oh, we cannot trust Muslims with democracy because they are going to abolish it. How can you abolish a democracy? They don't, they're not the military. The ones who are abolishing democracy are the, are the militaries backed by the West, backed by Washington. The Muslim Brotherhood has no authority to abolish uh, democracy out of the blue. Do you think Egyptians will accept it? I mean, this boggles the mind that this lie is told over and over and again uh, among the million lies that are sold these days and generally accepted in the media. I mean, this it just boggles the mind. It's not true. Again, I think um, I'm uncomfortable with the, uh, the equation that it's just the military and the brotherhood. Uh, those who voted for President Morsi were not all brotherhood. The issue today is about the right of the Egyptian people to choose. With all due respect, you may not like the leaders in the Arab world, you may not like Morsi as much as you dislike Sisi. We, or I myself, despise all the leaders in the Arab world. They're unrepresentative, they murder their own people, they, uh, they exploit the wealth of their countries for their own interests. But for the first time in decades, for the first time actually, Egyptians were able to choose their leader. That was not the choice of any uh, Western citizens. You have the right to choose your leaders. We have the right to choose our leaders. And we say to you that President Morsi was a democratically elected leader and that uh, he came to power not through the barrel of a gun but through the ballot box. The man who runs Egypt today is a, a, is a criminal. He needs to be put before the, the justice system, either of Egypt or the International Criminal Court. President Morsi is a man who allowed, during his year of office, greater freedom than in any time in the 20th and 21st century in, in today in Egypt. And that is acknowledged even by his opponents. There were no journalists in jail in Egypt at the time. Protests took place on a regular basis in Egypt. Uh, there was freedom of expression, there was a free media. Egypt today is a very different place. Whether you support President Morsi or not, there is no equivalence between what is happening today and the time of President Morsi. And you see, liking or not liking leaders is not a criterion. I dislike Mr. Harper. So what? You know, 38 percent, please wait a minute, listen to the answer. 38 percent, Mr. Harper was elected Prime Minister with 38% of the vote in Canada in a multi-party democracy. In a multi-party democracy in Egypt, Morsi was elected, I told you in how many elections in the Muslim world. So it's not a question of whether I like or you like or dislike. We must respect the democratic system, period. The rest of it is all excuses and rationalizations for our prejudices or for recycling untruths. You know, that's a fundamental principle that we must all accept. You know, Mr. Trump, whom we all like, <laughs> he was duly elected by the Republican grassroots. That's a reflection of what is happening to a part of the United States, and that democratic system has thrown up this idiot. <laughs> but you have no right to say that he cannot be the Republican nominee, which is why the Republican establishment is going back and forth, not knowing what to do. That's the grassroots I've spoken. The people of Egypt elected a far more sensible person than Donald Trump. <laughs> and he had, he had, and I'll tell you one more thing. He had, he had more votes than Mr. Obama did in the last election. So what are we talking about? We get so uh, disjointed in our thinking so, and so, so brainwashed. So Hitler hey? so Who? Hitler. So, so that's a very good question. So what is the alternative here? Should we say, 
Should we declare that some people have that Mr. Mosti was equivalent to Hitler? Was he? <coughs> in your head, so what is sorry, the, sorry, can we, no, can no, we no, stop no, back no, and no, forth? No, because we, we have other people at that. So, what, forth. so question is, what is the mechanism, what is the democratic mechanism by which you undo it? That is an obscene statement, actually. To say that a man that was responsible for the killing of six million Jews is the same as President Morsi. What word do you say? I'm sorry, I think you haven't listened to the group. You, know, you, you, you must have been living in a cave for the last few uh, years. I am sorry. I think that is obscene. It is, it is, it is, it is, no, it is actually, you know, it is actually, no, but it is actually an obscene statement to make, not against General, uh, President Morsi, but against the people of Egypt. Yes, yes, please, go ahead, please. Uh, my name is Bonnie, and I'm from the United States, and because I'm from the United States, I lack a lot of information on things that are happening in the Middle East. I um, do not know how to get good information, and the things that you're telling me are very new, and I totally believe you, but I would, I would like to have more information, and I don't know where to get information that I can rely on that's not out of date because it's in a book that it took three or four or ten years to write. Please look at the Human Rights Watch reports. The last two Human Rights Watch reports, or the reports since the coup, and look at the latest Amnesty International report that was written uh, just a couple, that came out just a couple of weeks ago. Just two sources, nothing to do with any political organization that is Egyptian, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, just start with th those, and an article written in The Economist just recently, just last week. What is the title of the article? Um, Egypt, but it's on the, on the front page of The Economist, the last edition, which tells you, again, just in a very short format, the, 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 the decline of Egypt under Sisi, the poor economic conditions that exist, the failure of the regime, and its appalling human rights record. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Siavash. I am uh, an Iranian from uh, this university in uh, So my question surrounds something that none have said. And one of the things about uh, being a scholar is to look at things that are not said, not things that are said. Uh, where is the internet? Where is the information communication technologies? When the, one of the biggest things that everybody talked about during the um, Egyptian uprising and the Arab Spring uh, was kind of a follow-up of the 2009 Green Movement in Iran, where people went on um, internet, on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever you want to uh, um, consider, and they, they used that to, order to, to find a way to get the information out. So uh, the lady who was here before us didn't know a thing or two more than what the official media talks about. So at this point, does the internet even matter for bringing any form of uh, uprising or any form of democratic reform in Egypt? Does, it, does, does information communication and technologies matter when there is deep state? Is it matter a great deal, it matters a great deal. It helped bring about the uh, Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. And this information is available. You see, this leads to a Another observation. You mentioned Iran, 2008, uh, Green Revolution, and so on. There was an appetite in the West to hear it, to know that people were opposing Ahmadinejad, that people were opposing mullahcracy in Iran. There is little or no appetite to know in the West that Muslim Brotherhood is being persecuted today. So it's really a reflection of our collective self, what is happening here, which is why I said what I said. We need to 
clear our minds of our own prejudices that we have, not against Morsi, not against Muslim Brotherhood, but the widespread prejudice and bigotry that exists against Muslims today clouds our imagination. You can be as anti-Muslim as you like. We are living in a free country. You can be as anti-Islamic as you like, but know that this is clouding your judgment on the events that are very important in the world today. That is the most important thing. Again, I, I, I appreciate the, the emphasis on um, the Islamophobia that we need to struggle against, on the injustices that have been committed against the Muslim Brotherhood and continue to be committed against them. But, uh, and I'll come back to the issue about the social media, but we must remember that in Egypt today, society as a whole suffers. The workers, the underprivileged, the middle class, the students, the women. These people are not all affiliated to the Muslim Brotherhood. There are some that are sympathizers, there are some that are opposed. It is true that the Brotherhood as a group has borne the brunt of uh, the repression and have been the group that has stood against dictatorship for decades. But what we're talking about today is a society that is suffering as, as it suffered for de decades and which is uh, repressed by a dictatorship. And the only outlet for it, actually, for those that oppose the regime, is the social media. It is active, it is important, it is the only channel that is open to the young and to all of us. Ultimately, there is no free media in Egypt. So the social media is the recourse of all those that want to speak out. Yes, please. Concretely, what can Canadian citizens do to help? Thank you. I mean, we restate our universalist principles that I have said, and I think we should hold our federal government's feet to the fire. Uh, why is it that this capital L liberal and small L liberal government that raised so much hope among Canadians and so on, um, and we were all elated that Mr. Harper is gone, that this young man has been elected. Uh, I personally endorsed him in my call. But I think it's up to Canadians to hold this government uh, to account. Uh, what does it have to say about Egypt? Its voice is muted because we are negotiating uh, a billion dollar contract for Bombardier at this point. So uh, we live in a pragmatic world. Uh, we want to do business and we are a trading nation, understood. But at what expense? Uh, what expense do Canadians think uh, we are willing, what price are we willing to pay uh, to stand up for human rights? And we don't. That's what you should be asking the government. And that's the question of the day. I think whether for the Canadian government or any other government, there are international charters, whether those of the United Nations or other organizations. There are conventions against torture to which countries have signed up. There are, as with, for example, the European Union, there are codes of good governance, there are uh, uh, limits to dealing with countries and sending them arms if those countries' security forces uh, repress their own people. There is a whole host of regula regulations uh, uh, connected to international law that we need to be aware of that, uh, that our countries' dem democracies, whether the Canadian government or the British government or others, are breaking by dealing with such countries as Egypt under the current regime. Yes, please. My name is Leo Gabriel from the initiative uh, peaceinsyria.org. Uh, uh, if you look back in, uh, let's say, self-critical way about the strategic mistakes which have occurred, uh, must have occurred if this has been the result. Uh, was it rather that uh, uh, the left finally got uh, too much antagonized towards the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and that uh, was a breakup of the unity? 
or was it uh, that, let's say, uh, the judgment about the relation of forces uh, between uh, the political power and uh, the military and oligarchical and so on power, because there must have been a, a, a sort of a breakup of the unity which existed in order to allow the counter-revolutionary forces to take over. Thank you. Let, let me focus on one issue that was a very important component in allowing the military to take over. And that was uh, uh, the, the Egyptian uh, elite, uh, political elite, that actually didn't value its democracy, the democratic process enough. And that ultimately it's opposition to the choice of the people uh, through free and fair elections made it stand uh, on the side of allowing a military coup to take place. They are uh, complicit. They are complicit, I repeat, in allowing the military takeover to take place because they did not value, this has nothing to do with supporting Morsi or the Brotherhood, they didn't value the people of Egypt, they did not respect them enough. They were an elite, a political elite, both individuals and parties, that were ready to sell the people of Egypt to ensure that they had a, a, a piece of the, of the cake. And they wanted to ensure, yes, that the, they wouldn't mind the military stepping back eventually, so long as they had a big share in power. They may have hopefully learned their lesson today, or some of them may have. But I repeat, democracies are about, it's a long process, it's not an easy process. It is about rights, it is about respecting constitutions and so on. But it is also about respecting the, the voice of the majority of people, the poor, the uneducated, the illiterate. I will tell you one thing. In Egypt today, we know that there is an elite that still continues to refuse the fact that the majority of people have the right to choose. They may not want the military, but they will not accept the voice of the majority. And that is precisely what we have to struggle against. As in all democracies in the world, the voice of the majority has to be respected while protecting the minority. That goes without saying, but my question was directed also uh, because... Uh, uh, it actually so, doesn't go without saying in Egypt, with so, all due respect. In Egypt, that is precisely the problem we face. But okay. Sorry, please go ahead. But there were also... Uh, it's, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, sir, excuse me. My, my okay. question okay. was about the okay. left. Just a second, please. Uh, just a second, please. Yeah. Just a second, if you just give me a second. I will give you a chance for a second question, or for after I take the two gent the gentlemen and the lady on the other microphone. Keep, be patient with us. Please, sir, go ahead. major reasons for the for the, the, the failure of this first free election in Egypt was because it wasn't a multi-party uh, election, it was a bi-party election. It was a choice between Mubarak's whole party or the Muslim Brotherhood, which left everyone else on the sidelines, which left the, the, the socialists, the left, the liberals, everybody, everybody was left on the sideline, and they had to choose between a rock and a hard place. As far as I can tell, in most democracies, there are two major parties anyway, honestly. And that is, in Egypt, yes, over time, probably in the following elections, there would have been more space for smaller parties. But ultimately, in Egypt, yes, you did have uh, the leftover of the NDP, you had the, 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 the old regime and its, and its cronies, and yes, you had the biggest social and political movement on the ground, the Muslim Brotherhood. But that is, again, not a reason or a justification of what happened uh, uh, in terms of the military coup. We can discuss for, for hours the components that allowed the military coup to happen, but that does not make it right. 
The fact is that Egypt was on a, in a, on a process as, 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 um, as many shortcomings as it may have had of going down a political process that would have allowed for greater democracy over time. That was hijacked. And the Egyptian people are left now with a military dictatorship that is supported by other democracies in the world. And that is what we are voicing our opposition to. In response to your question, let me just remind you that the United States also has only two parties. <laughs> does, it, does not obviate democracy. There are many other factors. It does. I, I don't think the United States is an example. No, no, it is an example because if, if in fact your question is valid, uh, we have to only two choices in the United States. It has its drawbacks, but it does not stop democracy from playing itself out in different forms in different ways and so on. So, Whereas your question is valid, it's valid only to a certain point. Uh, if there is no silver bullet in a democracy, these things take time. And over time, uh, different voices would have been heard. I do believe that other parties in the United States can still get elected. They can be elected. Okay. Good luck. Okay. After asking the question, can you please leave the microphone so we can, we can go on? Thank you. <laughs> you and I are having friendly exchange. Uh, hi, my yes, name please. is Elva. I'm from Paris. Um, in return to your to your uh, response, doctor, you said um, uh, Canada country and uh, uh, Britain, for example, uh, could stop dealing with Egypt by, uh, to support um, the citizen there. My question is more how the citizen from a rich country, um, shall we call to the boycott of uh, Egyptian product to support uh, Egyptian citizen or uh, Arabic uh, world to to bring to freedom and democracy. She's like I, um, I'm trying to think at a local. Uh, yeah, yes. No, I, if I'm not mistaken, the French government continues to supply missiles to Egypt. If I'm not mistaken, and you should look for whether or not France is supplying any military equipment to this military junta. And you as a citizen have every right to and a duty to call for an end to the supply of such military things to this government so long as there is no democracy in Egypt. That's a very concrete step. That sure. will hurt them. I, I think that there is a lot to be done also in creating awareness and pressuring parliamentarians and, uh, and academics and civil society as a whole to mobilize, to speak out, uh, and, and yes, to pressure in terms of arms sales, definitely, but also to say that uh, the French government should review its policy towards Egypt, that we as French citizens do not want our country to be uh, uh, supportive of these regimes and to speak out against the human rights abuses and to call directly, not just to be negative, but to call directly for the freedom of uh, assembly and freedom of speech and democratic guarantees for the citizens of Egypt. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, perhaps I was not clear. Try to make your question clear so you get a clear yeah, answer. Clear enough. Uh, of course, the oligarchies all over the world are not democratic. This is, goes without saying. But uh, uh, my question referred to the left sectors uh, who from a certain moment on split from the Morsi government and uh, even ended up, according to my knowledge, partially to join the movement which finally toppled the president. What has happened within the left? That is a concrete question. Yeah, I think the Thank you. from an outsider, and then I'll turn it over to Mahash, you know far more. Um, it, is, it is questionable. First of all, all the leftists, uh, a range of ideologies came together in Tahrir Square for democracy, for and a very concrete uh, demand of the toppling of Mr. Mubarak. Once that happened, in fact, one of the great criticisms of these people was that they had no ideology, they had no plans, but while they wanted democracy, they did not want, they want democracy without the Muslim Brotherhood. And their intentions were 
clear almost from the beginning. Whereas they were united in calling for the dictator to fall, rightly so, pent up feelings of uh, decades uh, of oppression. But once that happened, uh, what did they want? If they want democracy, you have to accept the result of the ballot. You cannot have democracy by saying, we will not work with people who have got 48% of the ballot. So the left really needs to look and into its conscience and say, they may have won a battle, but they have lost the war. Mr. Morsi was not a great president. Mr. Morsi may have been the most incompetent person. Mr. Morsi was no Nelson Mandela to unite the people. Mr. Morsi was no Gandhi to mobilize all the people. Agreed. But the left has to in turn ask. The liberals have to ask. You, their friends have to ask. Do you or do you not agree with the basic principle of the ballot box? And do you accept that result or you don't? These people certainly did not. And they systematically sabotaged the government. There is no question about it. Uh -huh. I have nothing to add. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Uh, just to teach you, just a comment so that uh, uh, all the, uh, my previous sister here about the how uh, what the Canadian citizen can do uh, or Canadian government can do to um, uh, decrease the supporting or cut the supporting to the military regime in Egypt. Clearly, there is a big, a big agreement between the military university and, military and the police universities in Egypt and universities here in Canada. And they sent uh, students who are military to study civilian like engineering or science here. This is with a different university in Canada. We have to force to avoid, to avoid cut this agreement between military and police universities in Egypt and uh, here in Canada. Uh, and uh, those who will come back again, they may be preach the, the value or Indian value uh, and violate uh, the human rights of the, uh, of the Egyptian people uh, there, or the innocent, the innocent people there. This is the first point. The second point, there is agreement between the uh, Canadian police and the Egyptian police, and this is funded by Saudi Arabia and Emirates uh, to train Egyptian, uh, Egyptian police where you can. This also this was in the Harvard era, uh, era, and this is also should be followed and we should be stopped this agreement. This is our, this one, uh, or these two things that can do and propose uh, and, uh, and ask our uh, new government to stop and point out this uh, agreement between the Egyptian uh, uh, government. Thank you. That's a very good proposal. I think you just, uh, what I would suggest to you is you should write this up in 750 words as an article and send it to me and I will pass it on to the Toronto Star and the others and so on, making precisely the points you have made and name the universities that have such agreements. Tell us the number of people who come from military academies and so on in Egypt to this country. A lot of us don't know these details. Tell us these details. Tell us about this agreement uh, that Mr. Harper had signed. And call for whatever you wish to call for. And that makes for a very good public opinion op-ed page piece. Send it to me, and I'll go to bat for you. I will. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first, before, before I, I... I would like to hear Mehran's comment about this kind of action as well. But before that, I want to say just because our time is running out, we have two persons at every mic. Please, nobody else should line up uh, the mics after that. Thank you. I, I think the proposal itself is very important. It needs to be exposed in, uh, to the Canadian people. But let me just say something about security sector reform and the idea that, uh, and that was a major thing after the election of uh, President Morsi in 2012 how to reform the security sector. They really didn't have a chance to get anything underway. But let me say the idea of training the, the Egyptian police force. It may sound, in theory, a good thing to uh, introduce good practice. But I think we have to go a little bit deeper than that. What you're dealing with, what the Canadian government is dealing with, is a regime that's a dictatorship. That ultimately, you may teach the security forces, uh, that they shouldn't shoot a protester in the head, that instead there may be tactics that are uh, kinder, so that the Egyptian regime starts looking a little bit better, that it becomes a little bit less embarrassing for the Canadian government and other democratic governments to support General Sisi. But what we are after is, yes, better practice by the security forces, 
But we need something much more deep than that, much more important. We need representative government and, uh, and, uh, and security forces that don't quell free protest. What these people, what the police force will be taught is tactics that are less embarrassing, that are less deadly, which yes, is a good step. But we want the freedom of assembly. We want people to be able to voice their opinions freely. That is not going to happen by supporting a dictatorship and teaching its security forces to behave a little bit better or in a way that is less embarrassing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick remark and, and then a follow-up question on that. Uh, the quick remark relates to the idea that uh, there was only a, a dual choice in the elections in Egypt. That was only the last round of multiple elections. The first parliament elected after the revolution, the number of political parties that actually got candidates into parliament in Egypt was in the double digits. Uh, and within such a vast field, the, the, the Freedom and Justice Party had 43% of the seats when, when there is double digits parties. And in the presidential election, we started out with 11 candidates. And among 11 candidates, Mr. Bursi came first and had more than 25% of the vote. It was only in the second round, which is the runoff election between the number one and the number two candidates that it was a dual choice. The follow-up on that is, at the time of the coup that toppled uh, the only democratically elected president we've ever had in Egypt, at that time, uh, there were preparations underway to elect the next parliament. My question to you is, under the new constitution in Egypt, would that parliament have been able to impeach the president, to remove him in some democratic manner? And if, if that is the case, why did the opposition to Mr. Morsi not try to go through the election of a new parliament that could remove an unpopular president and instead chose to call on the military to intervene? Thank you. Very simply because it would have lost. <laughs> very, very simply. I believe that the Egyptian people would have not gone on and the parliament would not have gone on to impeach him. I think we were sold a lie. We were sold a lie as the Egyptian people. We had a choreographed, a very beautifully choreographed opposition paid for by, by rich Egyptian businessmen and the United Arab Emirates to tell us that there was real opposition to President Morsi. They would not have allowed even for the last round of parliamentary elections because they knew that even if the numbers of the FJP were lower, they were still going to come in as the majority. And I think what we're being denied today is a symptom of exactly that. We're being denied the right of the Egyptian people to choose because if the repression was relieved, if people were allowed to go out and protest freely, knowing they will not be shot and imprisoned and tortured. This regime in Egypt will not last one day. It's a challenge we, as the ERC, put constantly. If you're so confident that, if Sisi is so confident that the Egyptian people are with him, why does he not allow Egyptians to protest? Why does he not allow them to enter Tahrir? Why didn't they allow for the parliament to decide what happened to President Morsi? Because I believe they, they knew that they would lose. And today they will lose and tomorrow they will lose if they open the space, the political space for freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. Last January, on the occasion, the commemoration of January the 25th, the military was on the streets of Egypt as an occupation force. If you saw the number of tanks in Egypt on alert, it was an occupying force. It was not a force to protect the people. It was a force to instill fear in the people. This is a military regime of the worst kind. And it is shameful that we sit in a democracy, whether in Europe or in North America, 
and are unable in some way to challenge our governments to review their policy. Something needs to be done. Like that. It's a very clear question about that. How can you describe an army and police forces went to this low level of morale that could be constructed an army? How an army could be like this? And if this is a case, we have compared with other armies that we never see something like this before. So how army can look, go to this deep like this, low level, and how can we construct an army that is not going to be like this? I hope I translate correctly, or I, that's, that's what I understand. No, you see, that's the difference between Tunisia and Egypt, right? The Tunisian army was unwilling to kill its own country, and this is why the dictator fell, which was not the case in Egypt. Uh, I was giving the history of colonial India. The soldiers who did the firing were the Gurkhas, who were hired locally by the British. Uh, so, I mean, um, rare is the army that would not follow the orders and so on. You know, how many... How many American soldiers who even disliked serving in Iraq refused to fight? You know, a lot of Americans who refused to go to Vietnam and conscientious objectors came to Canada, for example. But we have not seen such examples of late in many countries. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there is a culture of violence uh, that is endemic in the Egyptian security forces and military and so on. And yes, it is difficult. It is going to be difficult to reform. It is, it is an embedded culture. Uh, it is a culture of, a, you are, it's a conscript army. It's an army that essentially has not behaved professionally because it has been associated very closely with power. And that is the problem. This is why we want the military to return to barracks. It's association with power. It's uh, intent on holding power at all costs has made it very repressive. It is corrupt because it has it, it, it has actually a stranglehold on the economy. So it has privileges that it wants to keep at all costs. And this is why it is a dangerous thing to have the military in politics and running the state uh, affairs of the state because it becomes corrupted, it becomes unprofessional, and for its own survival, it resorts to, 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 to violence in order to survive. But yes, there is a very deep culture of, of that needs to be changed within the security forces and the military. 
and it, it, it's one that has lasted for decades. It is a very, very difficult thing to deal with. See, yeah, sorry, uh, just to add another honorable example one can think of during the 1979 revolution against the Shah in Iran. It was ultimately the armed forces that refused to shoot fellow citizens that turned the corner against the Shah of Iran. If you remember the Ayatollah Khomeini, whatever you may think of him, at mobilizing people and issued a statement uh, to the people in uniform, do not kill your fellow citizens, it was a famous decree that he had issued. And a lot of the soldiers refused to shoot. That was the end of Mr. Shaw, you know. Those, there are honorable examples like that, but one doesn't find them, too many of them today. Sorry. Please. Uh, yes, I'm with a group called Pink in the U.S. that's been trying to cut off U.S. military ties to Saudi Arabia, and we get so frustrated because uh, there's not hardly any people in Congress who want to go up against the administration. And uh, we're told uh, by our friends in Congress that this money to Egypt is really a subsidy to the U.S. weapons industry and it's to buy influence because the CC regime doesn't like the Obama administration and uh, they prefer to get many more billions that they're getting from the Emirates and the Saudis. And I wonder if there's a glimmer of hope with the downturn in the economy, uh, particularly in Saudi Arabia, and their uh, criticisms of the corruption of the CC regime, uh, might they be significantly cutting back and could this really lead to a uh, fall of the CC regime because of economic crisis? Thank you. I'm not an expert on it, but I have read a report of late uh, that given the oil prices plunging and so on, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are beginning to rethink their aid. UAE has certainly already recalled its advisory team from Cairo back uh, to Abu Dhabi, so we shall see. I think for a long time we've expected a different position from Saudi Arabia, yes, because of the downturn in the economy, and because of also its long-term interests and so on, that it may find that its support for CC may ultimately be detrimental. This hasn't happened because I think despite the economic constraints on Saudi Arabia, ultimately I think it tends, unless it can find a, an alternative in Egypt that is also very much under its wing, it will continue to support this regime because whatever the economic problems, of course they will play a part in terms of how much aid can be sent to Egypt. But ultimately Saudi Arabia does not want a democracy in Egypt. None of the Gulf states do. And they will end up always trying to look for an alternative, even to Sisi, that uh, will fit their interests and ensure that the issue of accountability and participation is not one that becomes foremost in Egyptian society and state, because they know that the implications and the effect of that on the Gulf states is, is something that they want to uh, delay as long as possible. I'm not even talking democracy. I'm saying greater accountability and participation. Hello there. Arabi situation. But I, I, I don't think my Arabic is good enough to answer the question. Um, I'm, uh, I, uh, I've been a student of Arabic and Islamic studies, and um, I, I, I have two main points to make. Um, the first is about um, Mursi, and the second is about the point of the Arab Spring. So the, the first thing I, I, I want to say is that I'm quite disappointed with tonight's talk. And I'm quite disappointed because I feel like all that I've heard is, is a criticism of CC and the military dictatorship saying it's criminal, it's evil, it's oppressive, etc., etc., and I, I agree with that. And then, on the other hand, saying that, you know, the, the real tragedy is that a democratically elected government, Musi, was kicked out. So it's not a single time tonight have I heard a 
criticism of Morsi, as if tonight, like, as if this is some kind of pro Morsi platform. And I'm very um, um, skeptical about that because I followed what was happening in Egypt under Morsi, and it was it was not a democratic society. It was a very oppressive society. He was cracking down on journalists. He issued um, his decree to have an attorney general who could um, make laws without any accountability. So he, he, was, he was in the process of becoming a dictator. And then there is, and, 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 and also, all of the economic concerns which, which sparked the Arab Spring, the poverty, the inequality, the corruption, that was not being changed. And, and that's what sparked the further uprisings in 2012 and 2013 that eventually made him so unpopular that the military moved in. So I'm saying I'm just very disappointed about tonight because I, it's a very one-sided picture about what's happening in Egypt because it, all I've heard is the yes, CC is the problem with the military. I've already appointed me. Let's see if he's no, finished. No, no. And like, let's no. get a chance to finish your, yeah. your question. Yeah. Yes. And just because he was democratically elected doesn't mean that he is a good leader. Mm -hmm. um, the, the current leader of, of t Turkey, Erdogan, he was democratically elected and has been several times. And he is a a fascist who, who openly admires Hitler and he is supporting ISIS, he's cracking down on the <laughs> academics, and it's horrendous. It's horrendous. And so, so you give her a sure. the chance to answer? Sure, but I, I, I also had a second point. Let's 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 see if it's related to, to this. Please. Of course it's related. Of course. Yes, go ahead. I'm, I'm, go ahead. I'm here. I'm here. Just finish in 30 seconds, please. Yalla, yeah, yalla. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the second point, which I think is even more so, is, which, which is even more important, is what is the point of the Arab Spring? For me, the point of the Arab Spring was never to have a liberal democracy. A, with what uh, uh, I kind of see as a fake de democracy, which we experience every single okay. day in Canada, in the United States, in Australia, in the West, a fake democracy where we elect politicians. So, so what, in your opinion, was the goal of the Arab Spring? The goal of the Arab Spring was democracy on the streets every single day by ordinary people men and women, young and old, every single day, face to face, in the squares, making the, the, the decisions horizontally, every single day. It was not about voting for these, a, a few powerful people, okay. to be in power for four years. Thank you years. very much. Thank but 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 I, but I want to say the, point. the what what we, we can be inspired by. Short, and we okay, point. but this is very important because in the we want to Middle East, give, we want to give there's the an extraordinary to example of what democracy is, okay. and that is in the Kurdish area of Syria, in a region called Rojava. Thank you very much. Rojava, thank you. Where? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Direct. If we enough time, we get our panel to answer. You. Democracy you is practiced every day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. No, I think you're you're not listening to what people have been saying. I said three, four times, Mr. Morsi may have been incompetent. Was incompetent. Mike. He was a divided. Microphone. Sorry, I said Mr. Morsi was incompetent. I said Mr. Morsi was partisan. Mr. Morsi was incapable of uniting the people. But. All is sins, the answer is not a military dictatorship. And if you found that we have not criticized him enough, 
that is deliberate because the crimes of the military coup far exceed the crimes of Mr. Morsi. If he committed crimes, which he did, the answer lies in the ballot box. People have to be patient and wait for the next election and throw him out. The answer is not a military coup. You may think otherwise, I disagree. I think the issue here is a defense of the right of people to choose. They may have chosen someone in 2012 that you find unpalatable or unsavory, but the issue is their right to choose. And that is what has to be respected. Now, the fact that we concentrated on the violations committed by the military regime is a very important issue. Because in reality, you may be aware of it, and I don't know how many people in the audience are aware, but the, the reality is that democratic governments have pursued policies to boost this regime and support it and legitimize it. And therefore, we have, uh, in a sense, uh, emphasized this. And there is no uh, bias in that. Dictatorship throughout history has committed uh, crimes that are known. But people continue today to say uh, that, that these crimes have been committed, to write about them, even though they may have been, they have passed, and even though the, 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 the culprits have been brought to justice. In the case of Egypt, the crimes are committed as we speak, and no one has been brought to justice. So we must not be silenced, and we must continue to insist that the regime in Egypt is criminal, and that there is no equivalence with a democratically elected leader, even if some people don't like him. So now we have ended the question and answer period. I just uh, would like to give five minutes of recap to each of you. Uh, if you don't want, maybe Dr. Maha would like to, to add something. But, but I, would, I would just like to, from here, from the podium, to add that the discussion today, uh, and that's related to a couple of the questions that were had, was about Egypt. And uh, please ignore statements uh, about other places that were not a part of the panel, that were not having the chance to answer. I don't want to open the discussion about Turkey or about other places. But uh, there, are, there are statements that are said that need to be, that might need to be changed. So please ignore them because we don't want to open this discussion from, from the beginning. Uh, Dr. Maha, would you have something to, to close with? Honestly, I think this was a, a fruitful discussion. I thank everyone for their questions. I think that we need to keep an eye not only on Egypt, but on the, uh, the Middle East region. The countries there are countries that suffer in different ways from dictatorship. Uh, there is underdevelopment and there is a great deal of corruption. I think we have a responsibility as citizens of the world to continue to delve into what's happening there and to speak out against repression wherever it may be. Thank you. So, with the closing of this panel, this is also the closing of the public events of the, of the World Social Forum. So, I hope that we all had a beneficial experience participating in any way we did in the World Social Forum. And we hope to participate in the next World Social Forum, wherever in the world it's going to be. It is a very important venue for people to participate in the process and not to leave it only to the governments to set the agendas. Um, for the Egyptian bloc that organized this conference in particular, I would like to remind you and invite you that, as was mentioned, in two days, it will be the third anniversary of the Rabah massacre, which was one of, one, of, was one of the biggest massacres that happened. And in the closing of the World Social Forum, the closing event in Jari Park, 12 o'clock, Please join your Egyptian brothers and sisters and others from all over the world who would want to commemorate this, this massacre and make sure that by our voice it will never happen again, not in Egypt, not in anywhere else in the world. 
Thank you very much for being here with us. thing on your way out, there's a petition asking the Canadian Parliament to study the situation in Egypt by human rights here. Please sign that petition on your way out. Thank you.